tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs> Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of two rounds of frightening fiction about dastardly demons, and bellicose books. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Christopher Keegan and J.M. Flynn are voice talents Andrew Berrios and Mr. Keegan himself. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Our first tale tonight is both written and performed by Christopher Keegan and takes us inside an asylum housing patients plagued by far more than the ill and inform. It houses the damned. Without further ado, I present to you, Blackroft. My name is Dr. Thomas Dugan, and what you are about to read is my story. It is not a fairy tale to lull children off to sleep, or some yarn told by a travelling performer to distract and entertain with a moral at its end. This story is much darker, for it is a true story, and must be told. I shall begin with my darling and long-suffering wife Elizabeth. She entertained my love of the medical profession so much that she followed me all over the north of England as I darted from one medical practice to another, constantly uprooting our happy little home in search of another project. Being of a restless nature, I never found anywhere that sufficiently challenged me. Elizabeth insisted that a child would provide the relevant distraction. We prepared thoroughly for our new roles as mother and father, However, what we were not prepared for was the death of our child before he even left the womb. Elizabeth is the strongest person I have ever known, and rather than succumbing to the great depression which hung over our heads, she encouraged a change, and urged me to go south to London to seek our fortune and build a new, happy home with a fresh start. That is how I found myself in a gentleman's club at 11pm on a smoggy London September evening, and sat across from me was Sir Robert Teeling. We'd roomed together at university, and whereas I roamed around with barely a penny to my name, Bertie had secured a hefty salary and a knighthood doing something or other for the government. "'My dear Doogie, why don't you consider the private sector?' he exclaimed in his boorish manner. Bertie, there is nothing I would like more, but I've spent the last few years lancing boils and treating cuts and bruises in Yorkshire. I hardly feel my skills are practiced enough for the private sector. Tell me, what do you know of medicine of the mind? You mean asylums? 
The treatment of the insane and irrational? Very little, Bertie. Only what I've read in journals. Uh, why? Are there opportunities in that field? There may be. There may be. Uh, a small government-run facility in Kent that I just happen to know needs a skilled doctor. The pay is extraordinarily good for a job of this nature. If you like, I could have a word. Bertie, I said, delighted by this turn of events. It sounds perfect. What's the name of the asylum? Uh, Blackroft. Blackroft Hall. It's amazing to think how excited I was when I first heard that name. I felt that this was my fortunes turning around. I was so motivated to get started I went home and packed that very night. And two days later I set out for Blackcroft. The heat and smell of Waterloo Station caught in the back of my throat, and the coal smoke swirled and turned the figures in front of me into wispy ghosts passing hither and thither. I quickly found myself a train and located an empty carriage. Happy to be out of the choking station, I slumped in the warm seat and made myself comfortable. Before too long the train pulled out of the station, and not long after that, my chin slumped onto my chest and my eyes closed. I found myself walking through a forest. The dead leaves crunched satisfyingly under my feet, and the branches above my head swayed in a pine-scented breeze. The sound of birds was so pleasing to me I stopped walking just to listen. This forest felt so alive, and yet there was something not quite right. A feeling in the air, like a storm was coming, like I wasn't quite alone. Suddenly I felt eyes on my back. I started to turn and, tickets please! I woke with such a start I almost fell from my seat. Uh, tickets, please, sir. I handed my ticket to the conductor, still breathing rather heavily, and my heart racing. Arriving at Blackcroft in fifteen minutes, he said after checking the destination, and left me alone once more. Blackcroft station was deserted, and I was the only person to leave the train. However, it was very clear where the hall was for a large, ominous building towered over the trees and across the fields ahead of me. A small facility, Bertie? I thought to myself. It looks as if it has five stories. As I got closer, my wonderment grew. Blackcroft Hall looked less like an asylum and more like a manor house or stately home. The turrets of this grand building reached skyward, and the large windows reflected what sun there was into my eyes. But the day grew cold, as I saw that every window had been painted black, and a chill ran up my spine. I finally arrived at the large oak door and reached for the brass knocker. As my fingers touched it, I was filled with panic, a sense to run, to flee, leave, and never come back but my hand was lifting the knocker and letting it fall with a crash that shook the glass in those horrible black windows. As the sound echoed away, I felt as if the whole world was holding its breath. Then the door opened. Dr. Dugan? Uh, yes, I stammered. My name is Cardell. Please come in. I didn't want to. The last thing I wanted to do was to step foot in this strange and cold place, but I did. I stepped through the door and watched it close behind me with a slam, blocking out the sunlight and plunging me into gloom. After a scratch and a sputter, a match jumped into light, causing shadows to dance crazily around me. Cardell lit a candle, and the flame steadied. This is not quite what I expected, I said after a pause. Why, what were you expecting? I don't know, a hospital, maybe? 
Somewhere where the windows aren't painted black? Our patients light the dark. You will too, eventually. <laughs> Hardly, I said. This man was unnerving me greatly. Do you wish to get started immediately, Doctor? We can give you some one-on-one -on -one time with the patients. He smiled and showed a selection of broken yellow teeth, which made his white tunic seem whiter still. One-on-one -on -one time. I know nothing about this facility or its patients or your method of treating them, and I am expected to start? Start what, for goodness sake? Doctor, you're here to figure out how to treat them. Follow me. Cardell led me up a large staircase and through a series of winding corridors. It seemed that Blackcroft had indeed been a stately home, but long since gone to ruin. The moth-eaten carpet beneath my feet let out puffs of dust at every step, and the mouldering paintings on the walls followed me with their eyes as I passed. Down another winding corridor and into a large room lit by gas lamps. Around the room was a shocking display of damaged humanity. The pale and emaciated bodies in this room were muttering to themselves, or rocking back and forth, or lying naked on the floor, twitching. The smell that reached my nostrils brought bile to my throat. I had to bring a handkerchief to my nose. Walk where you like, said Cardell, but keep your voice low. Don't touch them, and don't talk to them. Should they not be in chains, man? I said, barely disguising the panic in my voice. No need. Just don't trigger them, Doctor. Stay calm, and they will too. I began to walk between the human detritus around this room, and saw other members of staff wearing the same white uniform as Cardell, standing around the sides of the room, all casually chatting or reading. They paid no attention to me or their so-called patients. I stepped around cautiously, trying to get a sense of what was going on here. My mind raced and I began to feel dizzy. The heat, the smell. I made my way to a far corner of the room and leant against the wall far away from anyone, and tried to calm my breathing and clear my head. When, for the second time that day, I felt a gaze on my back, I turned and was met eye to eye with one of the emaciated figures standing a foot from me. His gaze burnt into me, and I backed further into my corner. Hello? I said foolishly. Suddenly a light seemed to ignite in those horrible eyes. Do you know where you are? It said in a rasping scrape of a voice. No, was all I could force from my lips. The abode of the damned. The home of the curse. For the possessed. Uh, and now we claim you, Doogie. My heart leapt, and I opened my mouth to try and form a word. There was a crunch and a splat as the creature spat in my face. I tasted metal on my lips and in my mouth. I reached up to wipe the sputum from my face and a smear of red came away on my finger. I saw it grinning back at me, the tip of its tongue hanging from a bit of sinew between the red blood-stained teeth spread wide in a grin, the eyes electric and manic. The creature's blood dripped down the corner of my mouth. My stomach heaved, I staggered and vomited, 
Between the gurgling heaves and gasping screams coming from my mouth, I heard more manic laughter. The man who had bitten off the tip of his own tongue and spat his blood into my mouth was laughing. His own blood was running like a flood from his mutilated mouth, his head thrown back in ecstatic mirth, and his laughter rang through me like a bolt of lightning. The orderlies were on him, wrestling him to the ground, and I ran, jumping over the clawing fingers of the bodies around me, down a dark corridor and another and another, down the stairs and through the oak front door, and into the murky gloom of dusk. My heart didn't slow its hammering against the inside of my chest until I reached the train station, and even then the rising panic followed me onto the train back to London. As I sat in the train carriage, I tried to make sense of what had happened to me. Who was that creature, and what on earth was Blackcroft Hall? I only knew one man who might have answers. I burst into the office of Bertie Teeling, most likely looking like a madman myself. My waistcoat and overcoat were stained with vomit, my shoes and trousers covered with dust and mud, and my face was drawn and pale. Doogie, what on earth? Bertie, where the hell did you send me? You have no idea the horrors I experienced at your godforsaken hall. For goodness sake, man, you're raving. Uh, Please, t take a seat. Tell me what happened. I sat down, and Bertie thrust a sweet sherry into my shaking hand. I began to detail my shocking exploits, and his face grew graver and graver the more I spoke. Finally, when I'd finished my tale, he stood up and walked slowly to the window of his office. Doogie, I'm so very sorry. I thought the stories about Blackcroft were merely fear and fantasy. What is that place, Bertie? It is an asylum. However, it is an asylum for those with the unfortunate luck to be possessed by demons or devils. Something that before today I believed to be untrue. Possessed. Robert. I am no five-year-old child. Those people were damaged, maybe beyond repair, but possessed? I should go home, and in the morning I shall catch the train north to see Elizabeth. You have damaged our friendship, Robert. With that I stormed from his office, trying to ignore his shouts that followed me. By this time it was very late, and the London streets were close to deserted. My tired feet dragged on the flagstones, but it wasn't long before I reached my rooms. Flopping down onto my bed, it crossed my mind to write a letter to Elizabeth before I leave for Yorkshire in the morning. But before I could think twice about it, my eyes were closed and my head was soft against the pillow. I was walking again through the forest. The fallen blanket of leaves crunched under my feet, however, this time there was no bird song, and the dark boughs of the trees above me seemed to choke the air from around them and made me panic for breath. The feeling of eyes on my back once more made the hair on my neck prickle uncomfortably. I began to walk faster and faster, and then run, and then I snapped and launched into a full-blown sprint of panic. My heart beat so loud I felt it would tear my chest in two. My lungs burnt with every breath and my brain was screaming inside my skull. Finally, I whirled around. Nothing. Nothing except the oppressive gloom that filled the forest. I turned back and my nerves shattered. Standing less than an inch from my face was the broken creature with the bloody grin and the tip of its mutilated tongue hanging between its teeth. Every breath it took showered me in drops of blood and saliva, and when it spoke a cascade of blood and bile fell from its lips. 
Dr. Dugan, we marked you, now we claim you. I opened my mouth to scream, but the beast slammed its hands to the side of my face and came in to embrace me. It clamped its jaws around my own tongue and bit down hard. I fell to my knees on the forest floor, choking on the warm blood that flowed from my mouth and down the back of my throat. Your life is ours, but we only want one thing and we will let you go. I looked at this being and my eyes seemed to be all the questions it needed. Leaning in close, it whispered, We want your wife. So there we are. That is my story. If you are reading this and you are not Elizabeth, then please share this writing and try to get it to my darling wife. Elizabeth, if you do read this, know that I have loved you dearly, but you should never come to Blackcroft Hall, even if you intend to visit your poor raving husband, because something else waits for you there. Besides, I couldn't talk to you anyway. I have no tongue. Today's episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. You may have heard me talk about BetterHelp before and how finding someone to talk to is so important. Maybe in your life, you're having a relationship problem. What interferes with your happiness? Is something preventing you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp can help. And it's not self-help. This is professional counseling. You'll get matched with your own licensed professional therapist. This service is available for clients worldwide, and there's a broad range of expertise available, which you might not have available in your local area. So if you suffer from depression or sleeping issues or trauma that you're having to deal with or family conflicts, stress, anxiety, you know the trick. Licensed professional counselors are specialized in those areas and others to help you get through and get yourself going on down the road. Anything you share with a licensed professional counselors with better help is strictly confidential. The service is at your convenience and it's affordable. More affordable, in fact, than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available too. Now, I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash chilling. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. I hope you enjoyed Blackroft, as written and voiced by the talented Christopher Keegan. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, as written by author J.M. Flynn and performed by Andrew Berrios. In it, we'll meet someone who offers us a warning about a seemingly innocuous so-called children's book, a book you should never open and definitely never ever read to children, and you're about to find out why. Without further ado, I present to you the tale of Roly-Poly. The book doesn't look particularly creepy. There are no ominous images on the cover, no words of foreboding. There is only plain red canvas with gold letters that read The Tale of Roly Poly. I never saw the book until Jenny pulled it from her collection on the shelf. It may have been left by the previous owners. We had only moved to this neighborhood a month ago. 
Jenny was already snuggled under the covers when I opened the book. At six, she was starting to read and never needed to be coaxed to bed if I promised her a story. Well, almost never. Princesses were her new obsession, and we'd covered most of the classics, like Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella. The tale of Roly-Poly was a departure from the usual set list. Are you sure you want this one, Pumpkin? Jenny yawned. Yes, Daddy. I shrugged and began to read. There were two boys. Two children like you. One was called Jack. The other was Hugh. The boys sat in their room, for there was nothing to do. They were so bored. A common boogaboo. The book contained a simple illustration of two boys in a bedroom, decorated with baseball-themed wallpaper. They thought and they thought. They huffed and they puffed. Until Hugh said, Phew! Enough is enough. Let's play a game. We'll upend this loose end. I know, said Jack. I'll call on my friend. <sighs> I groaned internally and hoped that Jenny would fall asleep soon. This wasn't exactly Dr. Seuss. Jack took the book and said the words written down, Come out, come out, you silly old clown. With a wish and a whoosh and a fizzle and pop, Roly-Poly arrived with a great big plop. There was an enormous figure that dwarfed the two boys next to him. The man was dressed as a traditional pantomime clown, complete with a rough, white makeup and garish red lips. How do, said the clown. I've come to play. You? said Hugh. Oh dear, holy moly. Don't be scared, declared Jack. It's just roly-poly. What shall we do, said Hugh all aflutter, as he pulled out his toys from the bedroom clutter. There were many games of various names, all wires and megawatts. A singing machine, a trampoline, there were even two robots. Oh no, said the clown, this will not do. Let's play some real games. Ditch this techno voodoo. Come with me and you'll see. My home is quite grand. You'll have all that you need in topsy-turvy land. The two boys nodded, their hearts filled with glee. They took the clown's hand and counted three Mississippi. Hugh and Jack closed their eyes as their world twirled and twirled. They whooped with joy as a new land unfurled. The clown's home was quite splendid. Full of candies and treats, the fun never ended. No parents, no chores, no bedtime or rules, no horrible homework from boring old schools. The boys played and played, and all three were glad, until one fateful day, when the clown became sad. What's wrong, Roly-Poly? Is there something we can do? The boys asked and asked, but their worry still grew. Oh dear, the clown mumbled, my apologies, most humbled. I'm just very hungry as his large tummy rumbled. Would you like chocolate? Or chips? Or gooey cream cake? We have hot dogs and ice cream and every milkshake. But the clown shook his head, for his belly did ache. Then he grabbed little Hugh. A fine meal you will make. My stomach flipped when I saw the contents of the next page. I shut the book immediately. Let's call it a night, princess. 
Jenny tried to protest, but her eyelids were heavy with sleep. What happened to the boy, Daddy? I'll tell you tomorrow. I kissed Jenny on the forehead and turned out the light. I went downstairs and poured a large glass of wine before reopening the book. The page that I'd closed contained an illustration of a gruesome scene. The clown held one of the boys above his head and had bitten into the child's left side. His teeth tore away chunks of pink flesh as blood trickled down his ruby-stained lips. The boy's eyes were shut, his tear-streaked face frozen in an agonized expression. Spurred on by morbid curiosity, I continued to read. Roly-Poly grabbed the boy and held him aloft. He took a big bite. Sweet Hugh was so soft. He gnashed and he gnawed. He chewed and he slurped. And when nothing was left, the clown loudly burped. He looked around. There was no Jack to be found. The boy had run. The chase had begun. Jack ducked and he darted. He ran and he ran. Roly-poly just chuckled. Come back here, young man. This place is large. Indeed, it does sprawl. There is no way out. No way at all. The clown was quite right, for try as he might, Jack rushed to escape, but there was no exit in sight. The boy grew tired. His breath became weary. Roly-poly caught up, sounding quite cheery. You're tougher than most. You I will cook. And he hung the boy up on an old meat hook. The child screamed and he shouted, You great fat liar. The clown licked his lips as he stoked the big fire. I turned to the last page. The boy dangled from a hook over a gaping fire pit. Parts of his skin were cracked and blackened as flames licked his small frame. The clown prodded the fire with a stick in one hand. The other hand waved to the reader as a maniacal smile revealed two rows of long, sharp teeth. The clown was so happy. This sweet meat was a treat. Hail to the chef. Bon appetit. The book ended there. I felt the bile rise in the back of my throat. What kind of a twisted individual writes something like this? It was probably a desperate hack writer looking for some notoriety. Whatever it was, it left a bad taste in my mouth. I finished my wine and threw the book in the trash. I woke up early the next morning and took the paper lying on the doorstep. It was Sunday, but I never liked to sleep in. I put on a pot of coffee and glanced at the headline on the countertop. My heart froze. Fifth anniversary of local boys' disappearance. Hundreds have taken part in a remembrance rally to mark the fifth anniversary of the disappearance of brothers Hugh and Jack Healy. The brothers, aged eight and six, were abducted from their home on January 7th, 2012. Police have issued a fresh appeal for information this weekend. Story continued on page three. I ran outside and removed the cover of the trash can. Perhaps whoever wrote that book knew something about the boy's disappearance. At the very least, I needed to report the sick material to the police. 
My stomach lurched as I regarded the contents of the can. The book was gone. A primal panic rose in my chest as I dashed upstairs to Jenny's bedroom. A single piece of paper lay atop the crumpled sheets of her empty bed. Jenny picked a good book, a true tale to excite, but her dad did not like it. He thought it was trite. He stopped the story at the moment of glory. Oh no, not for you. This part is unfit. The clown did not like that. Not one little bit. So Roly-Poly told Ginny, who was ever so skinny, Let's have some fun. We'll show that old ninny. And now Ginny plays in the land topsy-turvy, full of sugar and spice, and all things that are girly. While the princess holds court in dresses of satin, the clown simply smiles. She'll do. She'll fatten. It's been one week since Jenny went missing. I've given the page to the cops, but they're as baffled as I am. Every hellish verse of that awful book is seared into my skull. I can't sleep. I can't eat. I'm typing this as both an appeal and a warning. If you find this book, don't open it. Don't read it. Call the police. A child's life may depend on it. I hope you enjoyed The Tale of Roly Poly, as written by J.M. Flynn and performed by Andrew Berrios. Thank you for joining us for tonight's episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. As a reminder, take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week, when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Roshek. Logo by Craig Roshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. 
If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.